most proud of is Match the Flame, because I think that one has the most is the most historical future generations. There were a number of versions of I Am Legend that were written and they were all terrible. Um, so I, I wanted to write a female version of Lord of the Flies, not the same plot, but the same concept of, um, of a bunch of girls stranded on, on an island. Uh, when he sent me the introduction for uh, Psycho, uh, he included an apology saying his typewriter was in the shop getting fixed. And he called me up and he said, well, you've just made, you know, one of the worst days of my life, the best days. And just like that, we are now officially live with uh, for another episode here of Dark Bites. Um, so, of course, I'm your host, Rick Hipson, but most importantly, um, I'm here with Barry Hoffman, uh, publisher of uh, Gauntlet Press, uh, Gauntlet Press uh, magazine from back in the day, and the author of numerous, numerous books, uh, some award-winning books, as well as your award-winning uh, publication. Uh, Barry, I really, really appreciate you being here. I uh, can't tell you what an honor and a pleasure it is. It's been, it's been a long time since we first, uh, we first uh, got to know each other, and I know we've ta talked a couple times over the phone, but this is the first time we've actually had the privilege of seeing each other, uh, you know, face to face. Yeah. So, yeah. So I really, really appreciate that. So I can um, see Richard Matheson in the background. Yeah, exactly. Some old, some old friends here, uh, some old friends behind me. So, and um, yeah, and it's, it's funny, you know, I was trying to think of the very first time that we, that we actually got to know each other. Of course, it's through, through your books, like a lot of other folks have gotten to know you. Um, maybe your memory is better than mine. Jeez, it must go back about what, 15 years, maybe a little bit more, I think. Uh, it's probably a good 15 years, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I tell everybody when I try to think of how long I've been doing this whole, uh, uh, you know, dark culture journalism thing, it's, I want to say it's almost 20 years, but 18. And, uh, I think you're, you're pretty much the, the start of it really. I think I did maybe a couple of interviews before I met you, but then I really got, I really fell in love with, um, you know, with book reviews through the books that you published. And I, mm -hmm. I think if I'm not mistaken, it was, I've got it around here somewhere. I think it was Only Child, if I'm not mistaken, because I know um, uh, our uh, beloved late, late great Jack Ketchum, uh, Dallas Mayer, I believe he was the first author that I ever um, had the, the, the pleasure to chat with. And then I think he put me in touch. I think he's like, you know, I've got this book that's kind of coming out here. It's called Only Child. Uh, you know, there's this guy named Barry and this uh, place named Gala Prester doing that. Here's his email. Give him a shout. And I, I think that's what happened. And then, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Dallas and I were uh, were good friends. Um, uh, I lived in, in Philly um, uh, at the time. And uh, he um, lived in New York, um, which is where I was born. And yeah. I like New York farm more than Philly. Uh, so uh, we would go to um, uh, ChillerCon and I would okay. pick him up um, uh, at, uh, uh, at his apartment. Uh, I would, you know, drive him to the Meadowlands and, um, you know, we would share a table. Um, he would stick around for about 45 minutes and then go for a cigarette break, uh, <laughs> come back for another 45 and then, then another cigarette break. And yeah. uh um, uh, we had a good time at, uh, at those. Uh, F. Paul Wilson also attended, um, and uh, we ended up normally sitting next to a uh, um, former uh, Playboy uh, um, uh, centerfold. Uh, the different ones. They, 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 uh, it was a very eclectic um, uh, convention. Uh, it they, sounds had, like they had <laughs> actors. You know, mostly B-list actors, but they, yeah. you know, still, you know, actors who are from, were familiar. Uh, they had some uh, film makeup people and, and things like that, uh, yeah. authors, uh, and then they had, you know, um, uh, you know, these uh, uh, Playboy uh, um, uh, former centerfolds who uh, were making a good living selling. Uh, uh their photos at the uh, at the convention yeah aren't, aren't they all <laughs> it's a, it's a good business 
Yes, it is. It, it uh, um, so it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, uh, uh, you know, that Dallas was uh, fun to hang around with and, yeah. and, uh, uh, you know, we had a real good time together. Good, good. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, I remember I, I only had the benefit because of course I'm way up here, up North in Canada where, uh, Apparently not much of that cool stuff happens, but when it did, it used to happen in Toronto, which is about, I mean, I'm in Kitchener, Ontario. Mm -hmm. So Toronto's about, a, depending on how fast you drive in the, in the time of day, it's I'm gonna say about an hour, hour and a, and a little bit north of, of me um, for driving. And they used to have a thing called Fan Expo. Well, they still have Fan Expo, but um, several years ago, they used to uh, have a few, I guess, kind of smaller conventions in there where they used to like, a um, uh, a fantasy convention and also what attracted me there was uh rue morgue's uh, festival of fear used to be kind of umbrellaed under, underneath it all and uh, i went there a couple of years and the second year i was there um dallas was there he was uh, one of the, one of their guests of honors uh, that was actually the year that uh the lost was his uh, his first film adaptation lost was making the rounds mm -hmm. through the festivals and he was there to promote that they they had the movie there and uh yeah he was just a fantastic fantastic human being to talk to i uh i made a beeline for him and uh he took all my money willingly or i shouldn't say he took it all i gave <laughs> it all willingly to him uh, and he signed all of his books and then he had to go to the bathroom i guess for a little bit and i'm sure there's probably a smoke break that he stuck in there along the way as well took advantage of that and uh you know he ran to the bathroom and i was Jack Ketchum and my girlfriend at the time and I were both Jack Ketchum for a little while. I think we were in his, his table for him for about the half hour. It took him to fight his way to wherever he was doing and then elbow his way back. And uh, yeah, super, uh, super humble guy. So yeah, uh, he, yeah, we, uh, um, we, we had a stalker at the, uh, at the convention and um, uh, he would appear um, most often uh, when, uh, when Dallas was on his cigarette break and, and the guy would be, talking my ear off for until you know i guess dallas probably um looked in and saw he was there and decided to wait uh yeah, and the guy yeah. never bought anything <laughs> all he Jeez. did was he would look at dallas's books he would look at at you know gauntlet books uh and uh uh he was just a royal pain and never bought anything oh that's frustrating and i mean like it's like what do you that, that's a tough spot to be in because you don't want to cause a big ruckus for everybody else but at the same time it's like you know come on like uh you know buy a couple books and uh, come back in a few hours or something or yeah <laughs> but at the same time it's like here but but i'll give you a book if you just go away i'll put a yeah, good for you so should have tried that <laughs> yeah that's that's a yeah, that's a tough spot to be in and i found that too even the couple times it was made in the table i mean no doubt people the gig was up immediately people knew i wasn't you know i wasn't dallas i wasn't catch them and uh, they didn't buy his books but even at that time a lot of people come by and they poke around they talk to you and then they'd sort of carry on their way and i guess that's just the nature of it yeah uh, most of the people who would come by would you know buy something and and talk for a couple of minutes but they had things to do you know at the uh, convention as well so yeah. um uh there was you know just this one guy yeah. Now, are you still, I know you're not super active. I mean, nobody's active in conventions for a long time, a couple of years with our wonderful pandemic, but is that something you're hoping to get back to your, yourself or is that kind of a thing of the past or is it something you're hoping to do down the road? No, I, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm pretty much done with conven conventions. Uh, I had hoped um, uh, before I moved to uh, Colorado, um, the, um, there was, I think, a World Horror Convention in Denver, right. which is about an hour away, and uh, and it was well over twenty years ago. Um, and I, um, we we flew uh, R. C. Matheson out, and um, we um, uh, had a you know a book signing party, uh, and, you know, and uh, uh, it was really nice. Uh, but since then, uh, no one has has gone back uh to denver you know for a uh for a convention uh which is a shame i mean it's a big city um and uh, uh i think it, it would be uh you know it would be nice to be able to go to a convention like that but uh, i used to go to you know conventions mainly um I, I would get a table i would sell books um but you know now 
with the uh, the cost of flying uh, and right. uh, you know shipping books, you know um, wherever. Um, it, it's just not something that uh, uh, I, I would you know make any money on. And and you know some of the authors that I was yeah, that I would you know make the trip for uh, have passed away. I mean I you know I went to um, World Tower when it was in L.A. Uh, right. And um, uh, you know, had dinner with uh, Richard Matheson in in RC, um, and um, uh, basically had a table that had Matheson books because he came, and he um, um, you know gave a uh, uh, gave a speech uh, at in, in this room upstairs that I couldn't go to because I was at the table downstairs, right. and um, uh, he was in his late 70s probably probably right. then and um uh the thing that you know i found most intriguing uh and tip very typical of him is that you know even though we had said uh, you know earlier that he might not be able to sign you know very long uh he remained up there until the very last person uh oh. you know left and signed you know whatever they brought that's that's incredible and it's Definitely not. That's not the expect the expectation either. I mean, most most guys that I know of won't do that. I mean, there's several that I I I, I can say would 100 percent do that, but unfortunately, not not everybody will do that. Or if they do do it, it's because you know back to earlier with the uh, the centerfolds, they're they're charging a pretty penny just to to do that, and they right. they're, they're not going to sign anything that's they're not getting paid for. So it's uh, that's incredible. Um, yeah, both he and and I I never went there. But uh, Bradbury would go up to uh, the San Diego Comic Con, um, you know, even when he was, you know, wheelchair bound, uh, and he would wait until the last person had something to sign. And uh, when he got home, he ended up having to, uh, uh, you know, be in bed for uh, uh, a couple of days because it was exhausting for him. But yeah. you know, he just fed on uh, on you know the uh, uh, people, you know, asking for. His signature and he was very humble you know uh, about the whole thing but uh uh so he he went there again i i never went there but uh uh i did go you know to the uh uh one in la because you know richard was going to be there um you know and i could spend time with with both mathesons yeah that's pretty awesome so and that was that last convention you went to too wasn't wasn't that the one you got stuck in the elevator as well right that was Brian a chain or that was it. It, it chiller um, oh, okay. that I could. Um, uh, I, th I think Dallas was in the elevator as well. Oh, okay. Um, Not about uh, elevator to be stuck in. <laughs> well, it, it was funny. The uh, one side of the of the elevator was total was glass, and you could see outside. Oh, geez, that's um, the worst. <laughs> and uh, you know, um, th there was a phone. I think uh, in the elevator, or or someone had a cell phone, and they yeah. called the front desk. Um, and there were a couple of people who were panicking and whatever. And, and we're in this elevator looking down at people who were looking up at us and we're trying to say, oh, get us out of here. You know, uh, oh, uh, you know, could you tell someone in the front desk? Uh, so it, was, it wasn't until someone uh, called with their cell phone. Uh, and then, you know, we heard all this commotion outside the elevator as they, they uh, tried to open it. And uh, uh yeah, it was a unique experience. <laughs> I would say so. I mean, a lot of times, you know, with time with these amazing authors, they oftentimes write about, uh, you know, monsters that are scariest when they can't be seen. But that would be a monster that'd be pretty scary because you can see, you can see exactly how far you've got to go down. <laughs> yeah, and 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 the like elevator really crowded. I mean, it was, it it, uh, uh, you know, it was. I don't know how many people, but it was full. I mean, there was no way that we could probably get another person or two, you know, in there. So uh, uh, it, it, it was a unique experience. Yeah, hundred percent. And knowing Brian too, the survivalist that he is, I'm sure he's probably counting down on his head, hopefully inside of his head. Okay. So we've got this many people, we've got this much air supply. We've got this much time left. Uh -huh. <laughs> you start, start going on through all the, uh, all the, all the what ifs. So, so yeah. And I mean, it's one of the things that I, um, I can say kind of as a bit of an aside, I guess, is with your newsletter, Barry, and, and I'll definitely put a link for your newsletter in the description down below. 
uh, our chat here when it gets posted up is I love a lot of the anecdotes. So I don't think for the years that I've been following, you haven't always done that, but I've loved the fact that you have been doing that more lately, uh, where you put some anecdotes about, you know, some of your experiences with some of the, you know, the, the friends you've had in the, in the business, such as, uh, you know, Richard Matheson, uh, you know, Ray Bradbury, a uh, host of other folks as well. And I know that, I mean, I like when I first came across you with, with the only child, I mean, I kind of grabbed onto you like a dog with a bone and, you know, I, I couldn't get enough of this awesome material that you're, you're publishing as well. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, you've had a hell of a career and I've, I've loved watching all the books that you've been published. And I love the fact that as much as it's a terrible thing that so many of these people that, you know, that we've just talked about are, are no longer, no longer with us. Uh, they're still there and you're still keeping them alive as you've always done throughout the years, uh, put into all these incredible works. Uh, was that always sort of a plan? I mean, where did you see yourself as a, I guess, sort of a, a time capsule for these authors? Was it, did it come across to you that that is a great importance that you're doing with your, with your published works? Or did you just simply think these are great authors with great books? I want to get them out there. What was, what was your initial well, viewpoint on that? Uh, initially, uh, I wanted to uh, um, publish signed limited editions um, of you know, some of my favorite authors, Matheson, you know, Bradbury, um, uh, Poppy Z. Bright, uh, and, and, you know, and F. Paul Wilson and many, many others. And then with uh, Matheson and Bradbury, it got to a point where um, all of their well-known material had been published. And um, I was very lucky uh, to um, have worked with uh, Bradbury's bibliographer, Don Albright, um, yeah, yeah. and also to have um, become, you know, friendly, good, a, a good friend with with uh, Matheson. So what I mentioned to both of them at different times yeah. is um, uh, with with Bradbury, there was a lot of material that Don Albright, you know, found that had never been published. There was um, a uh, a novel that Bradbury had been had worked on on and off for you know 30 or more years called masks and uh he never finished that one um and but there was a beginning he had written there was a middle he had written and there was an end he had written huh. so uh, uh don approached him and said you know what if we can we publish you know this this book uh and um uh, you know pl plus there were other um um changes they were you know there was more than one beginning um yeah. and, and and things like that and and bradbury said you know fine so we put it together showed it to bradbury for his approval uh and uh you know and, and then you know published it um we um my philosophy had been and still is that you don't publish a signed limited edition if there's already one out there uh, so I never published Fahrenheit 451 because there had been uh, a signed limited edition. Now, now you have a lot of publishers who will publish books that have already been, you know, uh, uh, done. And I think that devalues for the collector uh, the original um, signed limited edition. Uh, and uh, uh, so I never published Fahrenheit 451, but what um, uh, Don and I um, uh, came up with was an idea of publishing all of the material that Bradbury wrote that led up to Fahrenheit 451, and it turned out to be a a, a massive book. Uh, there were there were novellas that had never been published, uh, short stories that uh, had never been published, um, plus short stories that had been published and other material that had been published. We put it all together. Uh, there were introductions and, and commentary uh, throughout the book. It's called Match the Flame. Uh, okay. And basically, if there's anybody who wants to know the history of uh, Fahrenheit 451, all they have to do is pick up a copy of the book. You know, they don't have to do any other research. It's yeah. all there. Perfect. And this is a fantastic time to get a book like that as well. I mean, it's so prominent right now with all, the, I mean, they're continuing with all these silly book bans and right, my right. local library 
was doing, um, I mean, it's, it's hard not to call it a witch hunt, but basically doing a witch hunt on books that they have in-house that they're going to they're gonna ban, and it's just ridiculous. And it's incredible that you can read a book like that, and obviously there are certain things that, you know, hopefully never gets to that, hopefully don't have these, you know, giant metallic robotic monsters come into our home to get our books or to, you know, extract us from the planet because we're reading these books kind of thing. But a lot of the other stuff as far as, people being afraid, I suppose, that you're going to read these books and you're going to get these ideas that, that aren't going to go with the way that, you know, polite society or culture wants you to have, they'll try to find a way to separate us from those ideas. And I, I just think that's so wrong. And I, it, a book like that is just so important, I think, more than it ever has been, I, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we had a unique experience with with Matheson because uh, I published a, a bunch of his, you know, well-known titles. Yeah. Uh, and then he, uh, he, he asked me one day, you know, would you want to read my first novel? Uh, it was his first adult novel um, that uh, was, was more of a mainstream novel. Uh, and he had, uh, he, he was a very insecure person in some ways, even when he became, you know, you know, acclaimed author. Uh, and he said that, uh, uh, he had shown it to his agent, um, and his agent said it was too long uh, for a first novel, you know, uh, uh, from a novelist who was trying to publish his first novel. Yeah. And what Matheson did, you know, unlike uh, uh, Bradbury, um, if Matheson was told no once, he would just put the uh, manuscript back in his drawer. Mm. Uh, so he sent me Hunger and Thirst. Um, it was, it ended up being like, you know, 700 uh, pages um, in book form, uh, and, and it was it was a great novel, um, and uh, we published that. Uh, and then you know later on, uh, he uh, uh, found another novel he had written when he was uh, in uh, in college, uh, and um, we published that. And then finally, he said, uh, uh, "Well, I was going through my stuff, and I wrote a, uh, my first novel." Um, when I was when I was twelve, uh, <laughs> yeah. and uh, um, and I said, did you try to get it published? And he goes, no, I just wrote it and put it away. Uh, and uh, an afternoon, he, you know, write a book. <laughs> he, he sent it to me. You know, I thought it was it showed a lot of of what the future Matheson, you know, would be like. Um, and uh, you know, I uh, you know, my only concern, first of all, it was a short. It was short. Um, and my, my other concern is that some people would, some, you know, of the reviewers and critics, um, it would feel, even though, the, you know, there would be an introduction that he wrote it now right. instead of, you know, writing it when he was 12. Uh, so what we did is, uh, I suggested that we put it, you know, as a, uh, as part of the Richard Matheson Companion. So it would appear, it would be published um, in a larger, you know, book. Um, and actually, the reviews were very good for it. Um, and uh, so it, we exhausted everything, you know, th that he had. Um, but I think I have a book here, too, actually. Sorry to interrupt what you're talking about. Where is it? Yeah, this one here. Just so folks know what we're talking about here. So uh, Leave Yesterday Alone. Sorry. Yeah, that's the one he wrote. When that's the one he wrote yeah. when he was at college, in college. And um, he never wrote an autobiography, but uh, there's a second, um, there are two manuscripts in that book. Yeah. There's yeah. one called Musings, which is um, um, a journal that he uh, wrote on and off uh, in the 90s and in the early you know, 2000s. Uh, and uh, it's very insightful. Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed it's the closest it. thing to a, uh, an autobiography that he ever wrote. Yeah. Um, but th there are a lot of his books that are autobiographical. Um, the um, Leave, you know, Yesterday Alone. Um, uh, it was, uh, you know, autobiographical. Um, Beardless Warriors. Absolutely, um, yeah. I talked about his his time uh, in, in the army. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, you know, Musings, uh, he's talking about, you know, um, everything under the sun, uh, you know, he even just addressed the question, which, um, uh, you know, I would have asked him, 
but I, I had the answer already, which was, uh, you know, why he never became as famous as someone like Stephen King. And he asked himself that uh, at some point. Um, and uh, he decided, and I agree, that because he wrote in so many different genres, um, he wrote five Westerns, he wrote mysteries, he wrote horror, he wrote sci-fi. Um, he, he wrote in so many different genres that um, he was not like, you know, um, categorized as, you know, in, in any one genre. Um, and I mean, he wrote things that, you know, people have seen, but they're not aware of. When they talk Absolutely. about the Twilight Zone, um, the one episode that is always mentioned is Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. Yeah. And that was written by uh, Matheson. It was not changed at all by Serling. Um, and was based on a short story, you know, Matheson uh, had uh, had written. Um, he wrote uh, Duel, which was Steven Spielberg's uh, first, uh, uh, you know, major uh, film. Yeah. Um, and then he wrote the, uh, uh, not the series, but he wrote the movies of the week for the Kolchak scripts, uh, for, the, for the Kolchak story. And um, uh, they were, you know, really big hits uh, on TV. Uh, but when, when they, he, he was not someone who wrote um, uh, sequels. And when they, they asked him if he wanted to be involved in the series, he said no. Dan Curtis, who uh, directed the films, also said no. So the series and the movies of the week are two separate and distinct, uh, you know, um, uh, things that you know Matheson did. So he, you, you ask, you know, uh, people, do you know who wrote uh, uh, the Kolchak, you know, was uh, uh, scripts? Do you know who wrote Duel? You know, right. um, uh, and, and uh, do you know who uh, uh, wrote, you know, the Nightmare Nightmare at Twenty Thousand Feet? You know, he he, he wrote um, like twenty two, I believe, Twilight Zone scripts. Uh, and uh, is, is, you know, wrote more than anybody else except Serling. He wrote a bunch, Beaumont wrote, uh, Charles Beaumont wrote a bunch. Uh, other authors wrote a couple. Yeah, I think Allison uh, did a few of them too for the second season. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got, you know, there was, uh, um, let's see, uh, Earl Hamner uh, put out a book of, of the Twilight Zone scripts that he wrote. Yeah. Um, but Matheson was the, was the one who wrote the most and, uh, um, but, you know, a lot of places, uh, publications, when they mention Nightmare at 20,000 feet, they don't mention Matheson's name. Yeah, and that still blows me away. I mean, it's, it's such a hard thing to grasp because when you think about it, he truly is the man behind the curtain where everybody understands his influence, but they don't understand who created the influence. I mean, I could ask just about anybody, hey, have you heard of you know, Richard Matheson, they, no, I don't think so. And of course you can rhyme off any number of things and, you know, great content. Uh, you know, I am legend, uh, what dreams may come. Um, I mean, there, the list truly goes on and on. Like, oh yeah, I know that movie. I know that movie. Right. Guess who wrote that? <laughs> so, you know, oh, okay. Well, I didn't, I had no idea. And it's just, it's incredible. I mean, I, I you know, I think guys like Stephen King probably wouldn't even be the authors that they are certainly if it weren't, weren't for the influence of of, uh, of Matheson. Well, King, King has has said publicly mm -hmm. th that uh, Matheson was was a uh, major influence, you know, on him. I mean, uh, you know, Matheson wrote about uh, uh, vampires before, well before you know uh, uh, yeah. King, and and uh, uh, then you know he wrote uh, Hell House, um, you know, a ghost story, which um, uh, you know, at some point King you know, uh, read it and uh, years later, you know, in a, his own idea, uh, you know, came to him. So yeah, uh, uh, you know, Matheson, uh, uh, you know, wrote a lot of things that, you know, no one else had, uh, um, you know, ha had done or had done as well as, as he did. Right. Now, do you foresee, because I know you've, you've had a really some extremely unique opportunities. I mean, I think that a lot of the stuff that you've had opportunity to be involved with and the folks you've had a chance to truly befriend is bucket list material for, for most fans of, of fiction in general, but certainly for, you know, the horror genre. And I mean, it's, you know, like you said, when you, when you talk about Matheson, you can't really say, well, of course, I, I know he hated the moniker horror, uh, I guess the terror genre, but he was really a, a genre in himself. Um, but you've also had an opportunity to actually go into his home, not only have, 
you know, as a guest with supper, but you've literally been, I know you mentioned, I can't remember if you told me personally or through your, one of your anecdotes in your newsletters that I think was through both, that Matheson would say, here's my drawers, see what you can find, have at it. Yeah, he would, so. uh, um, he took me to um, uh, his garage where he had uh, 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 several cabinets and, you know, you open up each cabinet and, you know, there, there were treasures, you know, uh, uh, you know, there. Uh, he also had um, a, uh, a room that was um, behind his refrigerator, which is one room we didn't get to because, um, you know, uh, we couldn't, you know, move his refrigerator. Um, but he had, uh, um, he had things all over the place. Um, you know, the one thing which, you know, um, he didn't do is he didn't save a lot of things that uh, some authors uh, did. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Ray Bradbury right. and Don Albright, who would literally uh, come out from the East Coast to the West Coast to visit uh, Bradbury. And anything that uh, Bradbury was going to discard, uh, Don would, you know, would, would take. Um, Matheson, uh, you know, uh, didn't have anybody, you know, like that. And, uh, you know, there, there are people who are shocked when they hear that, uh, um, you know, Matheson's first draft, which was handwritten always, of um, I Am Legend, after he typed it up, he tossed it out. Oh, see, I knew where you're going with that, and I've already got chills, and uh, that makes me just sad to think about. <laughs> so I eventually uh, um, uh, convinced him to uh, not to throw um, uh, his, um, you know, for handwritten drafts away. I said, we can use them in a limited edition as bonus material. Um, so uh, one time he um, uh, faxed me. Um, <laughs> he, he didn't, the, the only thing, um, he, he was not on, the, uh, uh, had no email. He was not interested in the internet at all. Um, RC bought him a portable email machine that he could plug in uh, and he used it once. And then he said, I, you know, I can't do this. Um, so other than a phone and letters, he, he had a fax machine. And um, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he, he sent me a, a fax one time, you know, saying, see, I didn't forget. And it was an introduction he had written, you know, that we wow. used in one of our books. And um, we used the handwritten, you know, introduction, you know, as well. And when we did uh, Pride, which was, um, I had an idea, which kind of worked, although uh, the two Mathesons didn't know if it was going to work. Um, I asked both Richard and RC if they could collaborate on a, uh, on a story. So what they did is they both wrote a short story based on an, an idea that they had come up with. Uh, well, then RC gives, gives me a call and he says, well, I got some bad news for you. Oh. Our styles are now so different from one another that we can't um, write a short story together. And I said, well, could you write like a teleplay? Um, because both of you are screenwriters. Uh, RC does it for a living. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Richard Matheson, um, he would do it with, without a contract even. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it was just something he enjoyed to do. So they said, we'll try. And they did. So they, what we, we had is a book that had um, the typewritten short story from both authors. We had the teleplay that they collaborated on. And then I convinced, well, RC does it all the time, but I convinced um, Richard um, to also, you know, send us the handwritten edition version of his story, which he did that had a lot of handwritten corrections. Uh, and we put that out and it was a nice, uh, a, a nice little book. It was, you know, uh, not, um, you know, all that long because it was basically a short story uh, and, a, and a teleplay that was, that, that was based on it. And, um, um, you know, at some point, you know, it, it was something that, that, you know, uh, Richard, you know, would, would uh, say, yes, I will send you the uh, handwritten, you know, uh, uh, you know, pages for this. And, yeah. um, and obviously, you know, the, the things he had written when he was young that were never published, he had tossed out any handwritten, 
you know, um, oh. <laughs> uh, pieces of that. What we did with, with the story he wrote when he was 12, um, uh, I, the two of us talked and we decided we would correct the typos, but we would not correct the misspellings. Um, yeah. Again, he was 12 years old. Um, yeah. So there were certain words that he used maybe a, a dozen times and they were spelled wrong, but they were spelled the same way each time. All of those were kept in. And then um, Richard wrote a short introduction, you know, where he mentioned that we have kept in, you know, the uh, original spellings, you know, and corrected, you know, any typos that there might have been. Yeah, and that was one of his very few intros, I believe, too, right? Because I know he he really kind of had some disdain for intros. He always thought there that there was no point for them. Yeah, um, you know, I, I convinced him to uh, to write a, a number of them, uh, mainly for the material that had been previously unpublished. Uh, I don't know if he wrote any intros for his classics, um, but yeah, he had to write, you know, I, I talked with him about it. And I said, you know, you have to, you know, someone's got to explain to um, yeah. uh, the uh, reader that, you know, you wrote this, you know, when you were in your 20s. Um, and, uh, and then why did, you know, was it never published? Uh, so he would write, he, he wrote an introduction, you know, for that. And then the same thing with the, uh, the one he wrote when he was, you know, 12. Um, uh, you know, I said, you know, people are not going to, you know, know that he wrote this right. that young, you know, and, and then in, in, you didn't try to get it published. You stuck it in a drawer. Um, and uh, uh, so on the, the material that um, uh, had never been published before that we were publishing for the first time, um, he wrote, you know, introductions, uh, you know, uh, uh, for, he also wrote, um, I think one of his first introductions, uh, I asked both he and Bradbury if, um, if they would write uh, an intro and an afterward for Bob Block's Psycho. Uh, both of them had 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 a blurb at some point, um, and so I'm I'm looking at all these different blurbs uh, on books, and I see both Mathis and, and Bradbury, and I hadn't really worked with them, uh, you know yet, um, and I you know approached them, and Bradbury you know uh, uh, said you know yes, um, right away you know he was, for both of them were very fond of of Bob Block, and uh, Mathis said well. I've never written an introduction before, but if uh, if you want me to, I'll I'll, I'll give it a, a go. And I, you know, my feeling was anything Please. which Mathis and wrote would be good. Right. Uh, uh, and uh, you know what happened is, is that um, they both wrote wonderful pieces. They talked as much about the man Bob Block as as they did the author. And um, uh, I sent. Uh, um, uh, Bob Locke, the um, um, the galleys for the novel, and that was the first time he read the introduction and the afterward. And he called me up and he said, "Well, you've just made you know one of the worst days of my life, the best days in my life. I found oh, out right. today I've got terminal cancer, um, and um, I'm not going to uh, um, you know take have radiation or chemo. I'm just going to live as long as." I can and and then I got home and I I got this manuscript and I read what you know Richard said I read what Ray said and uh, uh, it, it was just so wonderful and, and both wow. of them could have it was almost like they had collaborated together because they both said almost the same thing in their own unique styles uh, and uh, um, you know they talked about Bob Block the man Bob Block the author. And, uh, you know, then I asked, you know, both of them later on, you know, a couple of months later, you know, can I um, do a sign limited of, and we did, a, you know, a Illustrated Man for Bradbury. Um, it, it was either that or the October Country was first, I forget which one. And then we did um, um, I Am Legend, you know, was our first, uh, you know, Mathis. Very, that's very cool. And I mean, what a, an amazing thing to be able to be, to be a part of as well. I mean, that must have been emph amplified, you know, or emphasized rather exactly why you're doing this as well for the, you know, the positive impact you can make by getting all these words out there and, and 
it sounds like you're not just kind of bringing readers in with these fantastic books and these fantastic authors, but in a sense, you're also a bit of a matchmaker as far as bringing these amazing authors together as well. And that's, that's incredible. I mean, it sounds like if you kind of uh, looked at these blurbs and try to get these guys together, maybe, you know, Bob Locke would never have gotten that, you know, wouldn't have had that, uh, like a silver lining on, on a pretty otherwise right. terrible day for him. Yeah, but what, what happened is that as uh, I, you know, began publishing, you know, these various authors uh, with a Matheson and a Bradbury, my goal was to enhance their legacy. And yeah. that was one reason why we did Match the Flame and these other uh, books um, of Bradbury material that had never been published. And that's why I published so many of the uh, Matheson uh, material that Matheson wrote that had never been, you know, uh, published, you know, before, and probably, you know, would not have if, you know, I didn't every once in a while, you know, uh, tap, tap uh, Richard on the shoulder <laughs> and say, you know, uh, uh, you know, is there anything else that you might have found? And, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and then he goes, well, I don't know if you're going to want this, but I wrote a novel when I was 12. And I said, send it to me. I'll, yeah. I'll be honest, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, it, it obviously wasn't as polished as, as his, you know, later material. Um, yeah. But, you know, for a 12 year old, it was, it, it was incredible. Absolutely. And it's, it was interesting too. It was almost eerily foretelling of what Matheson in some ways would go through later on in life when, as he was, uh, you know, in the war as well, which like you said, he um, used that to, you know, mm -hmm. to illustrate uh, points and the beerless warriors and that uh, leave yesterday alone was essentially about a little, um, a young girl who was, if I'm, I correct me if I'm wrong, I believe because it was a long time ago I read that was a young girl who was essentially in war, a war torn country. I think it was Poland or part of Europe, I believe it was. And uh, mm -hmm. there was a romance that kind of happened and with that as well, going through this war torn area and the spark that this girl and this boy had found through all of that. And of course, what would happen later on if, you know, down the road as, as well, um, you know, as, yeah, as, a, as, you know, as she looked back on meeting this, this boy through that, and it was interesting that the perspective that Matheson had, I mean, sure, I guess you could maybe, if you look back, you might think that some of those ideas might have been a bit naive because they were designed that way from a 12-year-old boy, but they're also a lot, a lot of, uh, not just foretelling, I think, Matheson's own style and some of the amazing stories he would later write, but also of the life that he would he would live himself. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the, you know, the fortunate thing um, is that Hunger and Thirst was not picked up because uh, he might have then stuck to the mainstream. Uh, right. after, uh, it wasn't too long after um, he finished Hunger and Thirst and it was his agent told him there was no way that it would sell, that uh, he moved out to California and met all of these, uh, you know, fantastic authors who had an influence on him and he became, you know, part of their, of, of their group. Uh, yeah. And, um, uh, you know, the rest is, is, is genre history. I mean, it really you know, is. I'm Legend, Hell House, all of the books that, you know, uh, uh, that, that he wrote, the, uh, the screenplays, you know, that, uh, that he wrote, you know, based on them, the Twilight Zone, all he did, you know, for the uh, Twilight Zone, um, they may not have occurred if uh, Hunger and Thirst had been, you know, uh, published, um, although it would have been difficult uh, uh, for a uh, publisher to uh, try to categorize, um, you know, Hunger and Thirst. Uh, you know, I thought it was a very interesting book, you know, and it was very well written. And uh, it should have been, you know, published. Um, but uh, um, I'm glad it wasn't at the time because right. it changed his career path. And then later on, you know, we made up for it by publishing, you know, uh, the book. There's been no mass market uh, publication of, of that. Um, and, uh, um, you know, nor um, of uh, uh, Leave Yesterday Alone. Um, you know, so it shows, you know, the these mass market publishers are looking for a certain, you know, uh, uh, thing in an author. And, uh, um, you know, if an author writes something that's, you know, uh, uh, different, unless the guy is a megastar, 
like King, it's right. not going to get published. Yeah, and even King for a long time, I guess, had to, you know, so, I guess he did it for slightly different reasons because he was writing so many bloody books that he didn't want to saturate his fan base. So, of course, he created the pen name uh, Richard Bachman. And, right. And, 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 the, um, and they were uh, quite straight ahead horror as well. I mean, I think I saw, I watched The Running Man the other day, and of course, that came from Richard Bachman. Right. But the, the, it was the fourth one, uh, uh, the one where uh, people found out that it was Stephen King. Um, oh, I forget the title right now. Um, yeah, I want to say Blaze, but I don't think that's right. No, no, no. It was um, I. F I forget the title, but uh, um, uh, I think it took place at a, at a carnival. Um, well, whatever it was, um, <laughs> uh, it was thinner. Thinner. Um, thinner. Oh, thinner right. was. If you read thinner, you could see that it was Stephen King. Thinner was was pretty much a straight hot straight horror. But the other three were kind of off genre. Um, and uh, while there may have been some people who, you know, guessed it at it, um, most didn't. Um, but with Thinner, you know, you knew something was, was uh, a little different, you know, um, uh, with that than the other Bachman books. And that's, you know, when it was discovered yeah. that he had written these other three novels um, that... Uh, um you know under under the pseudonym but i you know i think that was part of it and i think with 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 thinner it was probably because he was writing you know so much at the time and yeah. uh, uh publishers were you know reluctant to publish two books by one author in a year uh and he was writing you know more than that so um uh he was one of the you know the first who would be writing two books each year and getting them published you know, yet he still was writing more than two books a year. Right, yeah, because I guess he would often write a novel, then he'd write a novella in between, then he'd write another novel. And, and uh, yeah, was, uh, you know, short stories and uh, novellas, you know, um, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah, and it's amazing too, because, uh, you know, going back to what you're talking about, where you um, got to a point where you're very comfortable and very driven to create these legacies for these authors as well. Um, one of the I'd love to know what your book is that you're the most proudest of because I think of all the books that I've read of yours and I've read quite a few of them over the years. One of the ones that really stands out to me as just a real treasure is the um, the uh, the Shawshank Redemption and Green Mile scripts that you have in there from uh, Frank Darabont and the collaborations that you have working behind the scenes on that particular book, uh, the various editions that you have for that book. Uh, I mean, it, when you think of uh, a treasured book, I mean, that one really does come to, come to mind in, in so many different ways as well. Um, do you think that one, would, would that one kind of uh, match up there, you think, with one of the books you're maybe the most proudest to come up with as far as the importance of that book, the, uh, the education of that particular book and, and so on? Well, I mentioned in our newsletter, uh, that would probably be third. The two I'm most proud of, the one I'm most proud of is Match the Flame, because I think that one has the most, um, is, is the most historical, um, for, for the future generations, um, historically, that's the most important. Um, the second one is Matheson's um, uh, screenplay for I Am Legend which remains today unproduced um uh, you know th there's a long backstory he yeah. was gonna, he he uh, wrote a script uh he sold it to hammer films uh in england um uh the british and u.s censors wanted these ridiculous changes um they there was it, it, it was too much violence and, and when you when you read the script and you see films today, you go, what are they talking about? Yeah, let's go um, Disney now these days. Yeah, um, uh, and also um, uh, he basically, you know, um, the, the main character was the, uh, Neville was the, the last person on earth. And then there was a woman, you know, involved and the, um, uh, everybody else had turned into a vampire. And the, uh, the censors um, um, wanted, someone to because uh, they they were living together eventually well the censors didn't like their them living together in sin 
Uh, so they wanted um, them to get married. Well, the question is, who's going to marry them? And who's going to be the witness? You know, <laughs> right. I mean, all all you've got are vampires and um, uh, and this man and this woman. So um, he, he said, yeah, "I'm not going to make any changes." Hamner yeah. film said, oh. "No, they're not going to make the changes." And then, you know, sadly, um, you know, they Matheson had given you know um, the rights um, to Hamner. Who then sold them to somebody else and there were a number of versions of i am legend that were written and they were all terrible all of them were terrible i mean you know he um Ma matheson enjoyed some of them but only not not as some uh, uh, as an adaptation of his novel he right. might enjoy them you know as a uh, um uh, as a movie um and uh uh you know with with the the will smith one you know, for instance, they changed the ending. Right. You know, I mean, changing the, you know, I mean, that's like, you know, uh, if Stephen King sent me a manuscript and said, you know, do you want to publish this? And I read it and I go, well, you know, you might want to change the ending. And, and uh, uh, I've got a couple of other ideas, you know, for you. It's not something yeah, I yeah. would, you know, I would ever do. Well, especially um, with such a classic ending like that. I mean, that the ending is what the entire book is going towards the whole time. Like the, the ending is the story. Right, right. So they um, they they change they change the vampires into generic monsters. Yeah, like uh, ghouls or some silly thing. Yeah, um, they uh, changed the ending uh, because what they, they were thinking of of making a uh, a sequel, and at, at one point they were even thinking of making a prequel, um, uh, and uh, um, so I had published the um, Matheson script um in a signed limited edition um and then i wanted to publish it in, in a uh in, in in paperback form and i approached matheson's agent um and she um uh, uh, she said yes you can do it but she didn't want to upset will smith's people so she said you got to include two other uh scripts in that book i said all right fine we did that and then a couple of years later when there was no sequel you know made or offered no prequel, uh, I approached uh, the agent again, and she said, "Yes, you can, you know, uh, uh, you know, publish it again as a standalone, you know, uh, uh, script." And and Timing we did is everything. Uh, yeah, we, we did that. Um, you know, included the letters from the from the censors uh, making their demands, and uh, um, um, you know, I'm proud of that because hopefully somebody one day you know some aspiring director you know will will be wandering in a used bookstore uh see that you know script pick it up and say you know i am legend should be done again and it should be done the way matheson envisioned it um and uh, so those are reasons why those you know two books uh i think are the most important that i've published i really enjoyed um the uh, Shawshank Redemption and uh, Green Mile. Um, I, I think that's, you know, uh, that was one of the most, you know, enjoyable books that I've, uh, you know, I've published. It was, um, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, it, uh, it took a long time, you know, to get done. Um, yeah. There were times when Frank Darabont, you know, uh, disappeared at times. He's a hard um, guy to track down. <laughs> But uh, at some point when we sent him the, uh, the finished manuscript, you know, all of a sudden he became really excited. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is, I mean, at, at that point, um, we were going to, we had to put, we we're going to put photos in. And yeah, uh, yeah. he said he had, uh, you know, personal, you know, an archive, personal archive of uh, photos that had never been, you know, published before. Uh, and he sent several hundred. Uh, some were in slides, some were photographs, and uh, you know that we added in the lettered edition a ten-page section. But in the numbered edition, we also had a large number of, uh, of photos. Uh, and he was the one who, you know, uh, after we were told no, 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 at least three or four different times, he said he would contact King, um, uh, Tom Hanks, and um, uh, Morgan Freeman. Yeah. Um, 
uh, to see if they would take part. And they all said, yes, the, um, uh, who was the other star of uh, Shawshank? Uh, oh, Tim Rollins. Uh, was it Tim Rollins? Uh, Tim Robbins. Uh, Robbins. Yeah. Uh, Robbins was the only one who never got back to uh, Darabont. And since we had the other three, uh, you know, Darabont wrote to me and, and said, you know, uh, do you want me to try Tim Robbins again? And I said, I think we should go to the uh, uh, printer and, uh, you know, get this book printed. It's, you know, fans have been waiting for it. Um, and uh, I think they're going to love it the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I guess you gotta draw the line in the sand somewhere. I mean, you'd have to have all of them, you know, oh, in, yeah. in there as well. And of course, I think you've also got, I think it's the the last or, or one of the last um, interviews, I guess, as well with the Michael Dark or Michael Clark Duncan in there as well. Yes, that's, uh, that's put in there. I know when I chatted with uh, uh, Tyson Blue, the the editor for that book a while back, I um, kicked myself now because I did the our our video chat for some reason didn't record <laughs> and so far that's one of my biggest regrets of uh, from doing the podcast as well is that he actually showed me the book and all the incredible pictures that were in there as well and especially the incredible marquee that you have in the book as well of Michael Clark Duncan I think it's sort of a dual page if I'm not mistaken um, a picture especially with him behind the bars it was just Right, right, right. Absolute pure artwork. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's incredible. Um, I suppose I'd be remiss, Barry, if I didn't ask, if you happen to have a copy of that book, Andy, would you? Uh, no, uh, the, the, um, okay. uh, I've got uh, so much, so many books and so little room. <laughs> can't, um, can't even imagine. <laughs> I've got, I, um, I mean, that, that, you know, that book is right now in, in, um, in in a in a box in boxes in my garage so that if you know there are still people who want to buy um um the uh regular numbered edition and uh, we do have copies of, of that available so you know that's that's in my uh in my garage i mean i've got i, I got a um a, a basement with with books i've got uh, um a a garage with books uh, my rooms you know all have <laughs> are you know the gauntlet books you know in them uh and uh, i've got a self-storage unit uh i visited today to see if uh i had a book a customer was interested in uh and uh i thought we were i might have a you know a copy or two there uh and then i've got another um uh warehouse in michigan <laughs> where, uh, so we, uh, initially um we had to print you know to make it cost effective, we had to print all 500 copies of our limited edition uh, at the same time. Um, now we don't have to do that, but um, very seldom uh, are you going to uh, uh, sell out of all 500 before publication. Right. Um, and, you know, with some books, they're going to go slower than others. Um, you know, some of the uh, Bradbury and Matheson went, you know, quickly. But I had some Bradbury books um, for a good, you know, 10, uh, 12 years. Um, and you've got to find a place to put them. Right. Uh, and um, uh, so I've got, all, you know, these books in, in, in a variety of, of places. Um, you know, plus we've also done some uh, trade paperbacks. And, you know, to, with trade paperbacks, it, uh, to be cost effective, you print 5,000 at one time. And it takes 10, 15 years uh, for a small press like ours to sell. You know, yeah, in the meantime, of course, where do you put them all? <laughs> right. So they're in warehouses, and uh, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm uh, when economic times were tough. Uh, those are the books that really helped us because people still wanted to read; they just didn't have the money. Uh, to buy a signed limited edition. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, they would go on Amazon and they would find, you know, uh, Richard Matheson's short stories uh, in trade paperback, 1695, buy a copy of it. Yeah. Um, uh, so we, we, did a, um, we, we did a bunch of uh, uh, Dallas, Jack Ketchum's books in trade pa paperback. We did a couple of Poppy C. Bright in trade paperback. Uh, and a bunch of uh, Matheson 
uh, you know, in, in trade paperback. And um, those sold, you know, during tough economic times uh, and uh, uh, helped, you know, keep us going uh, when, you know, uh, it would have been difficult to uh, um, produce a, a signed limited edition, you know, yeah. given that, you know, unless you had Stephen King, you were selling, you were not going to be able to sell all that many. Right, right. People go without eating a, a meal or two to catch up with the latest Stephen King oftentimes. And I know, especially the last couple of years, it's been, it's, you know, it's really tough. And I'm glad that you've been around so long. You've got the surplus and you've got these uh, um, additional options for people as well to, to purchase because, you know, between obviously the pandemic and the financial pitfalls of that, a lot of us have been going through. And on top of that, there's been uh, a major worldwide um, paper shortage as well. That's really been slowing right. things down as far as printing new books and, and such. I know, um, you know, for example, I was chatting with uh, with Trip, uh, Rich before he was talking about that as well, and it really slowed down us, uh, or it created. I didn't slow down, but it created def some definite challenges with getting his uh, his latest book out there, and uh, that he co wrote with Stephen King. And and I think it's really cool too that you mentioned all these books that are in these various uh, various places. Um, around the world and that too one of the things that i love about your newsletter and um hope everybody watching this goes down and does themselves a favor to to subscribe to them because you're always pulling things out it's almost like you know you're if you're back in matheson's home and you're just you know coming across these treasure troves of things that you just happen to have kicking around and that and, and that even though it always seems to happen when i'm either at the a couple last days from payday or bills have come up my in my own household and that too but you've got some incredible stuff various uh you know, signed, um, signed plates. Um, I, but you've had some artwork as well go out with, uh, you know, some of the Hiram Morris uh, covers as well and uh, a lot of other incredible things. Have there, have there been anything you've come across that you're like, I had no idea even had this anymore. I thought I sold the last one or oh, got rid yes. of the last that, one or. That happens all the time. Um, um, a, a customer will ask about a book um, and I'll go down to my basement um, which is where I keep um, certain, you know, uh, uh, books um, uh, that, uh, like, like, you know, I keep the lettered editions in my garage and, and some in the, in, in the basement. And I keep these, you know, one of a kind or, or uh, um, some books that I've bought uh, um, that I have maybe only a dozen copies. And I'll go down and I won't find it, but I'll find something else <laughs> that a customer three months earlier had asked about, um, and um, I'll go, I didn't know that that was there. Um, so yeah, I, 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 uh, uh, I do find, you know, a lot of, uh, a, a good amount of things that I was not, uh, you know, familiar with. Uh, one thing that it took me years to find, um, because I bought it when I was in Philadelphia, uh, when the um, uh, limited edition of The Stand came out, that was published by, um, uh, double day um, okay. and um, they didn't make it available to genre book dealers they made it available to um, book chains and bookstores that they dealt with so I um, I wanted a, a copy of the book so how do you get one well I called up um, there was a, 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 a small chain in the in the east called encore books and I called my local Encore Books and the person said, well, call up corporate. I don't know if we're going to get one. So I called up corporate. They said that they had, you know, like they were getting three copies. And if I wanted one, they would send it when, when the book came out to the local bookstore. Yeah. They sent it to the local bookstore. Uh, I went to pick it up and they had a problem uh, charging me for it because um, of, of the... Uh, cash register they had, uh, they were selling it for $300. Um, and their cash register would not go over 100. Oh, so they're behind there, like three people trying to figure out what to do. They ended up charging me $30 10 times, um, you know, for the book. They could do $100 three times? No, they couldn't. Just buy it a third at a time. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I let them do what they want to do. Exactly. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I put it in my, that was one of the things I put in my car when I moved to the Colorado. And yeah. uh, uh, I thought I had put it in one area, you know, years later, I was looking for it, couldn't find it in that area. 
probably checked that area four or five times. I mean, it was a shelf. Yeah. So, you know, um, and couldn't remember, you know, what I'd done with it. Uh, and in a different time, um, I, I've got like a, a pantry closet. Um, and don't ask me why I did it, but I, I saw a couple of boxes that I hadn't, you know, yet opened. I opened up one. There was was the oh, same. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I had put it there for safekeeping. Forgot that. <laughs> Save from you there. even. <laughs> right. Uh, so it was. Uh, um, it, it was a nice find. Uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I've you know I've still got it. Um, you know and uh, you know um, that and uh, um, my daughter wrote the king in the seventies um, and said that her father you know was was uh, um, you know liked his writing a lot and he uh, sent uh, um, a copy three it was a, a copy of of the three volumes of um, um, oh what's the uh, um, darn the uh, title skip uh, eludes me now. Um, it, it was a book that he gave to friends, and uh, uh, he didn't um, uh, he didn't sell. It, oh, it wow. was not. Uh, it, it might have now been made into into a short book, um, but uh, there was that, and there was also uh, a, a short story that he had, you know, bound in like a trade paperback, and, yeah. and he sent that to. Uh, uh, my daughter for me, and um, uh, she kept the trade, little trade paperback, and uh, gave me. I, um, God, I don't know why the name eludes me at the moment. It'll come back to me uh, yeah. at some point. Um, but you know, th those are you know nice little things, uh, to, you know, to, to treasure. Um, I mean, I, you know, I I would use stories by King Matheson, um, Block, uh, Bradbury. Uh, with my uh, sixth grade class, um, and um, then uh, and also the, uh, another author uh, I enjoyed was Henry Slazar. Um, okay. he, had, he was a typical. He, a lot of his stuff was filmed by Hitchcock because he had twist endings uh, at the end. Oh um, yeah, that's that's Hitchcockian. <laughs> uh, and he uh, um, uh, so I would have the kids write. They, they wrote to Slazar and they wrote uh, to Bradbury. Uh, and uh, Slazar uh, wrote back to each of the kids individually. Uh, Bradbury sent the kids a poster, um, which he signed, uh, and uh, you know we 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 hung up in the room. Uh, and again, you know, at that point I was a stranger to him. You know, I didn't know him from, and he didn't know me at all. Right. Uh, uh, but and, and he didn't have a secretary. He didn't have a secretary. Matheson didn't have a secretary, and Block didn't have a secretary. Uh, and you you wrote to them, they would write back to you. Um, now you know you get a lot of authors today. It, um, well, very few people write a letter to them. Right. They'll write an, an email, but you know um, uh, you know you can tell that you know these authors were more than just great authors they were just wonderful people um because of the uh, of, of the way they handled things with with bob block uh i would write him and i'm writing him in when, when i was in philadelphia the letter had to get to to los angeles and then i would get a letter back within a week so he would respond that's quick probably the day that he got it put it back in the mail so that I would end up getting it within a week's period of time. Uh, and then once, uh, when he sent me the introduction for uh, Psycho, uh, he included an apology saying his typewriter was in the shop getting fixed. Um, <laughs> you don't hear that too often anymore. Uh, no. Um, and he wanted, you know, to get me the introduction. And I had told him, there's no rush. Um, so you know, working yeah, with that's incredible. I mean, th there are some people who are you know uh, still around who are, are just as good. I mean, David Morrell, when we did the uh, Rambo books, we asked for bonus material. He kept sending, he kept finding new things, and he kept sending them and sending them. It was wonderful, you know. Um, uh, Owen King, 
uh, when we did a double feature, his first novel. Yeah, I got that one over here. Yeah, you got that there. Um, I asked, you know, uh, the big one. You know, do you have any material that we could use as bonus material? And he said, sure. You know, and he told me some things and he sent it to us and we used it, you know, and that's one of the um, hallmarks, you know, of uh, of Gwalt that I, I uh, we, we uh, there are a lot of, of, of specialty press publishers out there um, and they'll print a book uh, and that's it. You know, they take the, 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 the classic, they publish it, that's it. My yeah. feeling is that you, you either, you know, have bonus material or you get some, you know, um, hopefully big names um, to sign it. Uh, and um, with, you know, with Owen, he had a lot of bonus material and we were able, you know, uh, 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 to use that. Um, when we did uh, Taxi Driver, um, uh, you know, Paul Schrader said he would contact um, uh, Martin Scorsese and see if he would, you know, uh, uh, write a short intro and, and sign our lettered edition. And then when he said yes, and then we contacted Scorsese, we asked Scorsese about De Niro. And he said, I'll contact, you know, De Niro. Now, there were other people, you know, uh, Jodie Foster, we contacted several times, never got a response from her. Hmm. That I don't like. If, yeah. if, if an author uh, or celebrity says no, I accept that. I mean, you know, they have no obligation to say yes, you know, uh, especially, you know, when they're not going to be getting uh, either paid anything, depending who they are, or not being, getting paid much. Yeah, at least give a courtesy. I mean, you're there to help promote their, their stars, their, you know, their, their people, whether they need it or not. I mean, that's, you, you also don't have to do that either. They, they should, uh, well, they should at least give you a courtesy. I mean, it, it helped De Niro's career. Taxi Driver helped De Niro's career. He didn't yeah. owe, you know, uh, Schrader or Scorsese anything, but, you know, he might have felt, uh, you know, that he had an obligation that, you know, yes, you, you know, uh, you gave me a great part, you know, I'll, uh, all, all you want is my signature and a couple of, uh, uh, in a short, you know, uh, a couple of paragraphs. Um, so, you know, we, uh, um, we did that, you know, and um, with, uh, uh, with, with Matheson, it was, it was, because he had given us so much already that we had used, what we did with, with Matheson, we published one of his books and then published in, a, in chat book form a, an unpublished short story. So if you bought the book from us as opposed to a dealer, you would get the book and you'd get, you know, what, what is now a collectible, uh, you know, a chat book, a first, you know, first printing of a short story. Um, so I was always, you know, I, I, when I, I, I publish, when I publish, uh, you know, material, I do so, you know, thinking, what would I like to see in a book? Right. And what I would like to see in a book, you know, if somebody has an uh, alternative ending, I'd love to see it. And I think, be, I, think I think their fans would love, you know, uh, to see it. Um, and uh, um, a deleted chapter. Um yeah, other things like that. I mean, with with Matheson's last published book, Other Kingdoms, um, we, we were going to do a limited. And then um, he ended up selling that one to his mass market publisher. And he said, no, I don't think we need a limited for this one. Fine. Uh, the mass market publisher made some major changes. And, you know, Matheson was in his 80s. Um, and he was never one to push back. Um, he didn't like the changes because he called me up. He said, you still want to do a limited, um, you know, uh, of the original manuscript. And I said, sure. <laughs> yeah. And I, um, you know, I read both and I saw what, 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 what the mass market publisher did. There were some things, um, it, uh, the book took place, um, a part of the book took place in the 1920s. And the father of, of the main character was a racist. And he uses some words that, you know, um, people, <laughs> are, you know, racist use um, yeah. that, you know, um, are 
not used today. However, they are used if a person is writing a book that takes place, you know, I mean, if something is taking place during slavery, you're going to use certain words that you would not use today. Right. But the, the book's book, got to be honest. Right. Um, there was that. And then the other thing that they took out, which uh, was like a page, it was over a page and a half. Uh, in the book, there's a self-induced, the woman has a self-induced um, um, abortion. She doesn't want to have the kid. Um, and Matheson did not, was, was not gratuitous in his, you know, description of violence. But he is, was very precise and very graphic with this abortion scene. It was probably his most horrific scene he's ever written. And the mass market publisher took it out. Um, and just basically put down abortion. Um, and uh, so Matheson changed his mind, decided he wanted, you know, uh, a version out there that um, was not um, um, uh, uh, censored in any way, um, yeah. you know, was, uh, and, uh, you know, we published the book the way he wrote it. Good. Yeah, I've actually got um, Other Kingdoms, the mass market version on there, and I was in the process of reading it. And I was enjoying it. And then you mentioned that to me, and I thought, well, why do I want to read a watered down version of it? So I'm just uh, going to put that off until I, I can grab the, uh, eventually grab the other one from you, because yeah, it's like, you know, there's a reason why director's cuts, you know, certainly in videos are so popular right now, because I think that's what a lot of people really enjoy as well. They want to, you know, get more as, as immersed into things as much as possible. I mean, I'm certainly, uh, a self-professed absolute nerd when it comes to that stuff. I mean, a lot of times I want to know how they did it before I, you know, in all the deleted scenes, the alternative stuff before I go back and I actually watch what we ended up with because a lot of the times, you know, there's all the stuff that what we ended up with is, is a watered down version. It's gone through so many hands and censorships and, and all of that stuff. And I think it's incredible that you truly are a specialty, a specialty press and that you don't want to yourself down. You create what, everything that there is involved in, in a certain project, that's what you put in there because it is all part of that project. Yeah, well, I think, I, I, cool. I think there are some filmmakers today who are filming certain scenes, whether it be for TV or a movie, that they know um, the powers that be are not going to allow it. But if there's going to be a director's cut, they can put it in. The you know, one thing I was not aware of, I, I, I saw a short documentary a, a while ago is uh, in, the, in this, the original Star Trek, um, when they had um, Michelle Nichols and uh, uh, Shatner kiss, um, yeah. they filmed it and the uh, powers that be at uh, NBC didn't want to put in the interracial kiss. So they did, they, they uh, Shat, Shatner um, uh, was opposed, you know, to refilming it, um, yeah. um, but apparently, you know, he was forced to refilm it. But when he refilmed it, he did something with his eyes so that there, were, there was no way that the um, uh, director could use it. <laughs> so they had to use the other version. That they had. <laughs> that's um, great. And, you know, he, uh, that's the kind of thing that, that I'm doing, you know, with with books, you know, putting yeah. in, you know, material that um, um, you're otherwise, you know, not going to... Um, are going to see. Uh, I, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but we uh, I can't even mention the name because we don't have a signed contract. Um, but we're going to be publishing a book next year. Um, and then I asked the author, um, do you have, you know, like an alternative ending? And um, he told me, he said, oh, wait, I do. Um, <laughs> and, and in this ending, something totally the opposite of what I wrote occurs. And I said, can we use it? And we go, sure. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's not, you know, for the mass market, uh, I, I, I mean, he said, I like the other ending better, the one I, I used. Um, yeah. But this was my original ending. Uh, and I read it cool. and it just it didn't sit as well with me. Um, so, you know, you can, you learn a lot about the author um, right. by, uh seeing this you know uh additional material that uh that we put you know put in the books and um uh so i'm not just publishing you know a, a the other thing which is similar 
is we've, we, we've done a couple of Clive Barker books. All the books we've done by Clive Barker have had cover art by Clive Barker. Some other publishers, Specialty Press, have published books by Barker with another author doing the cover. Barker is 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 not as incredible renowned. artist. He's not as renowned, right? Of, uh, for his being an artist, but uh, in in uh, the nineties, um, um, the my partner at the time, Buddy Martinez, who uh, passed away um, uh, five years ago, uh, we went to uh, Barker's house. He has two houses, right? Okay. He did, they were, that were next to each other. Huh. One he lived in, one was solely for his art. It was like a museum. Wow. Art museum. Uh, and he took us through the, uh, uh, through the whole thing. Um, and he ended up using a lot of that art for uh, his young adult novel uh, uh, series, Aberat. Okay. Um, so if you've got a, a, a guy who is um, also known for his art, why not use him for the cover art? Exactly. It's the same thing with Bradbury. We, we, yeah. used, um, we either used Bradbury or uh, Bradbury's favorite art, you know, artist at the time, uh, Joe Mognini. Mognini's passed away, so it's not like you know, we can right. do uh, you know, when we did mass, I can't, I couldn't say, you know, you know, let's dig him up and see if, if, if he'd be interested. Um, yeah. But um, no, that would be, that'd be a little bit too specialized. <laughs> and Bradbury, you know, the one thing he asked is um, when we did, uh, when we, we did, for instance, uh, the first one, um, um, let's see, what was the, uh, the first, uh, the first time we, we, we used Bradbury, Bradbury's art. He asked us not to put any lettering on the um, uh, on the front cover, yeah. uh, uh, and because he wanted to, to highlight the art. So all we did is put the title of the book on the spine because we knew we were not going to be selling this, you know, these books uh, at at uh, regular bookstores. Right. You know, people, people knew what they were buying. They don't go in and buy a signed limited edition. No. Um, you know, like with the stand, I had to special order that from corporate. Um, so, uh, uh, and then, you know, uh, after we did that, um, Matheson, um, didn't want to have art uh, on his first covers. And yeah. there was a reason for that, that I found out later on, you know, he really didn't like his mass market, uh, covers where he had no say in it. So, he, you know, with the first book, he, he wanted the red cover black slipcase. That was for I Am Legend. Yeah. For Hell House, he wanted the same thing. I was very friendly with, you know, RC at the time. And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. You got to have black on black. And I said, I'm not going to call up your father and <laughs> you speak to your father. So yeah. he, called, he called up uh, his father uh, and, and, and he, he agreed black on black. And then when I spoke to Matt, this and next, he said, for the next book, what are you going to do, pink? <laughs> we did Stare of Echoes, which was great. Yeah. Um, but when we, when we did Hunger and Thirst, because it was his first novel and had never been published before, he yeah. knew that there had to be a dust jacket, which meant there had to be art. And, that, and, and I gave him a number of artists that he could pick from. He chose Harry Morris and every other book that we did since, you know, from then on. Yeah. He only wanted Harry Morris to do the cover art. Uh, and uh, Harry was thrilled because he was in awe of Matheson. Um, uh, Matheson, you know, sometimes wanted changes. And Harry was very good about making changes. Um, and, uh, you know, he would, you know, be biting his nails and waiting <laughs> you know, for, for Matheson to uh, uh, yeah. give him the okay. You know, and and he just really liked his work. So for the first well, for hunger and stuff, thirst, yeah. um, uh, we did not put uh, any lettering on the uh, uh, on the cover. Uh, you know, uh, he asked us not to put you know lettering on the cover, and you know, fine. You know, uh, um, yeah. and you know, uh, there are other publishers who used Harry and published some Matheson books. And, you know, on some of them, there's no lettering on the cover. So you can tell, you know, 
when Matheson um, was, you know, involved in the publication of a book, uh, and you know when he just sold the rights, you know, to a publisher uh, for the book. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's incredible, and I mean it's such beautiful artwork too. It, it's I mean it complements him so well, and Harry's got such a unique style as well. It's very almost like an abstract, but you also have to be very clever and aware of the art too to really see what's going on inside of it. And then of course, once you get into the story, you can see that's when the cover really comes alive and you kind of get what the cover is and what the cover is trying to trying to reveal. Well, so. unlike unlike most uh, horror artists, he's no one trick pony. Uh, if you look at, at um, uh, the covers that he did for Matheson, the covers he's done for F. Paul Wilson, the mm -hmm. 10 volumes he did of, of yeah, the back here. Too, I think. This is, uh, and then if you go up um, there. on my book, Where's right, this? on my books, um, uh, because, because they, there's eroticism in the books, uh, yeah. like with Blind Rage, you look at that book and you look at the cover of uh, another one of um, Harry's books, you wouldn't know it's the same artist. Right. Yeah, this one here, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit less abstract. I mean, it's a bit smoky and there's some subtle things going on. I mean, I guess if I were to connect them all, I mean, I think that's one common theme that I see with this book is there's a lot of subtle stuff going on. Yeah, well, yeah, but, right. But, but this but one's not as quite as abstract. Yeah. yeah so what were you saying? Yeah, he did, uh, uh, you know, um, he's done the cover for all of my uh, signed limited, you know, editions, um, as opposed to what uh, uh, I had leisure, leisure books did, uh, uh, did trade, did paperbacks of a couple of my books. And uh, when I look back at them now, they're horrible. Um, yeah. they, they, they really don't say anything about what the book is about. Uh, if anything, it confuses you, but you know um, that's the kind of of uh, you know when you're dealing with mass market you know publishers, uh, you've got to you know if you want them to publish your book, you got to go by their rules, uh, and that's why yeah. that's why there's a specialty press because with the specialty press you should be able to do what the author wants, and Absolutely. that's you know that we we always have. Um, the audit, the author can pick whatever artist they want, uh, and they whoever it is, they have final approval, you know, on the artwork. Um, and you know, well, in like in one of the newsletters I mentioned, there are a couple of covers, you know, um, uh, by other artists that you know we've used um, that I haven't particularly liked all that much. But the the author wanted that <laughs> artist. The author liked the art. The author got the art. Yeah, that, that's incredible. Because I mean, at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about. I mean, that is the product that is what it is you're trying to, to celebrate and to provide to the to the fans and the readers is the author and all in, in their truest form. So it would make sense that if they want an artist, then you know, why not that that's a part of what their tastes reflect. And that's what you're giving to the to the readers. So. With Bob Block, that was the only thing he wanted input on. Um, he had, he detested a, um, a most of the paperback covers because they were all based uh, on the movie. Um, and he did, you know, while the, the movie is very faithful to, um, uh, to his novel, it's there are the differences. Uh, and um, uh, so um, um, we, I think it was Alan Clark did the, did the cover um, and uh, spoke with, with, with Block about it. Um, I think he, 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 the first one he rejected, the second one was spot on, and it was just what, what Block wanted. But when it came to like the introduction and afterward, he says, oh, I don't, I'm not worthy of, of, of somebody, you know, uh, writing a, an introduction and afterward. You want to get somebody, you go and get them. So I aimed <laughs> high, and, and I fortunately got, wow. you know, two of the best authors uh, in existence. Um, but you know he he wasn't uh, you know interested. Uh, different people are interested in different things. You know right. F. Paul Wilson we, um, sends us. We don't need it because we don't make changes. But he sends his mass market publisher a list 
it's, it's, it's literally a full page, maybe on both sides, of things not to change, certain wow. punctuation not to change, so other things not to change, um, because he knows that the mass market, you know, publisher may well make certain changes based on, you know, what's acceptable grammar and things like that. Um, for us, he doesn't have to do that. He just sends us the manuscript, uh, and we're going to um, uh, we're not going to edit it. Um, the only I, I've never edited, trust. I've never edited a uh, 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 an author. What I what, what I did once um, is Matheson sent me a short story, and I um, read it and I loved it the way it was. I had two questions that confused me, and I asked him about it, um, and he t he told me what the answer was. So a couple of days later, I get a fax from him. He actually changed the two areas to clarify them. I didn't ask him to do it. Wow. You know, this is something he did on his own because I asked him. Um, I was curious about something and he wanted to clarify it. Um, so he decided to edit himself. But with Hunger and Thirst, 700 pages, all he did, the only change he made, he cut out one paragraph because it, the rest of the book was from the point of view of the main character. This one paragraph was from the point of view of somebody else. Hmm. And that's the only thing he, should, he you know, put an X on that and said, the rest is fine. <laughs> that's incredible. And that obviously shows that everything that you've done, all the hard work and and the faith that you have in the authors and, and your drive to be able to present them as honestly as, as you can. I mean, that, that's obviously paid off with that trust. And that's, I mean, that's the sad thing is that, that clearly you just don't get that kind of trust with the mass market paperback. I mean, like, you know, I remember chatting with, with Dallas a few times. And I mean, I think he, he's mentioned this several times as well about that god awful cover that I believe it was Leisure that put out for the girl next door with the, the friggin' cheerleaders on the cover of it. Oh, yeah. Like, Yes. Like really, really, like that's there's nothing to cheer about in this book, and they 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 couldn't have picked a more horrific and this stupid skeleton on the face, and it was yeah, it was horrible. I think that was one of the things he mentioned as one of his biggest regrets was the fact that that cover existed <laughs> in his body of work, and it's yeah, it, you know, um, you know, if if you're going to um have a specialty press, you know, you 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 want to cater uh, to the author. Um, I mean, like, you know, one thing we always do is uh, we send the final manuscript, you know, uh, to the author. Um, once in a while, we'll have an author um, um, like myself, who's a terrible proofer, who will say, could you get somebody to proof this for me? Um, uh, you know, uh, because I'm going to miss things. So we find somebody who can, you know, uh, uh, proof the book, who has read, you know, um, that particular, uh, you know, author. But there's other authors who, um, you know, are just happy to be able to look at the book before it goes to the printer, and proof it. Maybe yeah. make a couple of changes. Um, you know, with with RC, um, and I knew this from you know, from the first time I worked with him. Uh, he would write an introduction, and when when he went to proof it, he would change things <laughs> totally. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't be recognizable, um, but, you know, it, it was something with that I knew he was going to do and that, you know, as long as we could read, you know, his, his uh, handwritten corrections, we were able to uh, make the changes, you know, so that's, you know, one reason why uh, certain authors, you know, uh, like working with us because we're not going to surprise them. Yeah, hundred percent. And I mean, that's the worst kind of surprise when you get that, and you're excited. You got this new book, and all that hard work, and all that so a little time putting in, putting in the work, and etc. And then finally get the, the product. And I can just imagine that sinking, horrible feeling of just getting a horrible cover or these major changes. And yeah, that's, that's just got to be a horrible feeling. And it's so good that those those kind of authors don't get those feelings for you with you. Um, one if you don't, one oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah whose name I won't mention, um, yeah. they did a Bradbury book um, where they did the cover art uh, and didn't uh, get, didn't send it to Bradbury for his approval. And oh, he, uh, he, he didn't like the color uh, um, that was used. And uh, basically they had to do, do uh, uh, another print run 
uh, of the uh, cover um, because uh, they hadn't gone to him for approval. You know, all you've got to do, Dark Carnival is the book that, uh, um, uh, yeah. well, I don't know why that slipped my mind. That's the- Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the book that uh, we used. That's the first book that we used, Bradbury's Art. Um, and, um, well, not, not, not the first, the second, where we used Bradbury's Art and we, um, uh, and he asked us not to uh, use, you know, any lettering. Um, when we, when we, were, we did his first book, the October Country, that was, uh, um, I believe, Monyani's art. But when we did The Illustrated Man, um, I just threw it out there and, and, and asked uh, Ray if he would uh, want to do the artwork for it. He said, I'll give it a shot. So he, <laughs> he did a, uh, a, 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 a pen and ink, you know, um, uh, a drawing. Um, and he, said, he faxed it to me. He, he also didn't use the internet. He faxed it to me and he said, is this okay? Um, and I looked at it and I go, of course it's okay, you're Ray Bradbury. Um, and, and after we did that, oh, you have, you have a visitor. Yeah, my little boy just ran in here. <laughs> yep, that's Barry. Hey, buddy. World meet Mackenzie. <laughs> hey, buddy. So, yeah, that's and that's incredible too. Like how many, how many people even realized that Bradbury was was an artist in his in his own right as well until they saw that representing his own his own work. Right, and, you know, and you'd never know that about him in a, in a mass market well, world. After that, um, a, a lot of other people, asked, especially presses, asked if he would do the cover, and he uh, declined and said, "I'm retiring. My uh, my art supplies." <laughs> um, because he knew what he, what he'd be getting into if yeah. he did, you know more more covers um but you know if 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 there's somebody who is is known you know for his art you use that and that's what you know yeah. like with walker uh why use somebody else's art when you can uh um you know use a guy who's uh, uh, you know considered a, a well-known artist well know? yeah and clearly when they're okay with it as well i mean like i know i've got some i think i don't remember when it was a few years ago i think now where rue morg um he was their ply barker was their um uh, their, their feature in there and of course what did they have on the cover they had a you know an, uh, one of a kind artwork that Cly barker did so clearly it's just a matter of asking them and it's terrible that Obviously, there's so many other publishers out there, mass market guys that publish this stuff that never even bother to, to simply ask the question. Even specialty presses sometimes won't ask the uh, uh, the author. Um, if, uh, uh, I mean, I, we've done books um, where I've seen some sketches that the uh, um, author had done based on one of the characters in the book. And yeah. we're doing limited. And I said, can we publish the... Uh, uh, the sketches, you know, uh, they're part of, of, of you know, it would be wonderful bonus material. Your fans would love it. Uh, and uh, that was Marie Lou. We did her trilogy. Um, and uh, uh, she said, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's just a matter, you know, of, of asking the author. And if the author doesn't have anything, um, you know, it's not like you're going to, uh, say, well, I'm not going to publish your book. Doctor Forum, I need to start. Yeah. Um, you know, they'll, uh, um, they'll, you know, we'll get somebody to write an introduction and signed lettered edition. Um, you know, my feeling is that you don't fill a lettered edition with additional art unless the artist is, is you know, uh, somebody unique and special. Um, right you have a uh, uh, a lettered edition um, and you put material in that the uh, reader is not going to find any place else. And it might be in um, when we did Illustrated Man, um, we um, included both Monyani's work and Bradbury's work because the way they operated, um, Bradbury would draw this rough sketch really rough. Um, this is before he was, you know, doing art seriously. 
And then Monier would take it and make it into, you know, a work of beauty. Well, it made sense to include the Bradbury sketch and the Monieni finished piece uh, so that the uh, reader could see the interplay between, you know, the, the, the two men. And um, uh, like I said, that is one of the, per the reasons to be for the specialty press to do things that the mass market uh, publishers wouldn't wouldn't think of doing. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and it's it is great that there's that there are guys like you out there that are still doing this. And now are you as far as looking down the road as, as well, Barry, um, for the end of this year, I know it, it folks that are following your newsletter are probably already privy to this, but for everybody else that's kind of under a rock or just as, as yet to actually um, do the right thing and subscribe to your newsletters on um, what is what is coming out for the for the rest of this year that we can look forward to. Well, what we're I'm sure it's a bottleneck of stuff, but what we're working on now is uh, called Phoenix 451. Um, yeah. It's a Bradbury book of his scripts for Fahrenheit 451. Um, and um, uh, right now it's at 700 pages and it's going to be longer. Uh, wow. <laughs> probably, you know, around 800. Um, but uh, um, that, it, that's, you know, um, uh, one of our, uh, uh, tr another treasured book, uh, I think that uh, because it's, it's got a variety of, of Bradbury scripts that he wrote, he wrote a musical, he, uh, you know, he uh, uh, had a lot of things uh, that he did, you know, uh, based on Fahrenheit 451. And uh, about five years ago, um, when I thought we would be able to do a Bradbury book without a problem, um, we got William Shatner to write a, a short introduction and sign okay. tip sheets. Uh, he did charge for the tip sheets. Um, yeah. And uh, so the lettered edition is going to have uh, Shatner's, you know, uh, uh, signature, you know, uh, uh, you know, in it, along with the short introduction. Um, and um, nice. so that's going to be, that's what we're working on now. Because um, you got those tip sheets before he became an astronaut. <laughs> he probably would have charged you more. <laughs> that's true. That, that's true. Or he would have he would have signed them when he was on the uh, spaceship. Um, we we um, we're, we're doing the sequel to Ray Garden's um, uh, Ravenous, which is called Beast Jill. Okay, looking uh, forward to that. So, um, and uh, uh, F. Paul Wilson has a two book series that he wrote. Yep. Usually, like with Repairman Jack, he's got like twelve books. He wrote another series with three books. This wow. se series, there's only there's two books, and because of when he wrote them, we're publishing one probably early summer, late spring, and okay. one you know uh, in the winter. So we're doing those two, uh, and we're doing them in collaboration with Borderlands Press. Uh, gotcha. I've done, we've done some collaborations with them before. Yeah. The other collaboration with Borderlands Press we're doing is the second book in. Uh, um, Blake Crouch's uh, uh, series. We did Pines. It's, it's the Pines uh, uh, series. We did Pines last year. We're doing Wayward this year. And I forget the name of the third book. We're doing <laughs> the third book uh, in, in 2023. So uh, uh, we're, we're going to be doing, you know, those, those four books are, are going to be um, more than enough to keep us, uh, you know, busy. Uh, the other thing you, you have to be in mind mindful of is the effects of the pandemic, you know, um, will, will not have ended for years and years. I've had people who because of the pandemic have said, you know, I either had to pay my mortgage or, 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 or buy, you know, um, the, uh, um, the um, uh, Darabout book. Um, yeah. Uh, and, uh, the miracles, you yeah. know, yeah, I decided we, we, I needed to live in a house. So we paid the mortgage. Which is um, fair. I mean, books are great. It's a fantastic book, but yeah. Other people, you know, um, need the money for because one person in the family may have lost their job. Um, there, there are any number of reasons. So, um, you know, we're not flooding the market with a lot of signed limited uh, editions um, because, you know, we know that even people who or completists, you know, may have problems, you know, buying um, 
uh, more than one or two books, you know, signed limited editions from us as well as other publishers uh, during the year. So we, you know, I, I have, when I started out, we did, you know, two books a year, yeah. um, you know, so doing four books, um, especially uh, the Phoenix 451, which is the Bradbury book, you know, when you're doing a book that's going to be uh, close to 800 pages, it takes a lot of work. That's an um, enormous, uh, enormous task. So, um, you know, my layout, you know, editor has been working on it, you know, will continue to work on it. Uh, and then, you know, we'll do these, these other books. Um, and, and, you know, and then what I do is start lining up, you know, things for, uh, for next year. Perfect. Well, I really commend you on that, uh, Barry. I mean, it's, you know, you're clearly as in touch with your authors as you are with, you know, with the fans and the, and the readers as well, you know, because I think that a lot of people probably appreciate that. And that's clear though, keeps keep you, the, if I can speak properly, keeps people coming back for, for more of your books as well, because they know that's what they're going to get from you. So, and it's, um, this isn't a drive through uh, fast food that they're, you know, that, that you're selling here. So that's incredible that you're, obviously treating as as a specialty press and giving people the specialty treatment that they obviously come to expect from you you know and i can say too as somebody that's communicated with you for several years going on i guess two decades now almost um you know you've been nothing short of uh you know a gentleman and professional and kind and, and honest and, and extremely transparent as well and you know and that so i mean you and you've certainly you're a big door opener you know you've obviously connected a lot of authors with each other as well and i know for myself i've got lots of great opportunities as well that you've helped me out with as well i mean certainly you know for example the hope of miracles helping me out to get me in touch with uh you know with frank darabon and a host of other authors that i mean i wouldn't even know who they are if, if it wasn't for some of your awesome books as well so i uh you know yeah well definitely commend the, you on all that there's no reason if the person uh, author agrees for me to keep you know his information secret you know, um, you know, what I, I normally do is I will, you know, contact the author first, you know, can I give out uh, uh, your yeah. email address or, or should I give out a phone number, you know, you let me know, or do you want this person's, you know, uh, information, and you can contact, you know, him or her. Um, uh, I mean, that's, you know, the, the way to go with a lot of these authors, you know, you know, justifiably love talking yeah. about you know the, their work and i know you know when when darabout you know uh, saw the the manuscript and all of a sudden he starts getting really excited and uh, and, and all of these photos show yeah. up at our door um and then we've got to you know figure out ah which one's the one we're going to use you know we um you know which which ones i know, you know I, I wouldn't want that job <laughs> to use them all <laughs> you know it, it it was it wasn't easy but but, yeah. but it, it was uh, it, it was a lot of, you know, fun. Um, and it, it was uh, also a lot of fun seeing, you know, um, uh, how excited he got um, yeah. near the end. Um, and, and, you know, we've even made uh, some a change. We had uh, initial, uh, Barker initially, his assistant had sent us cover art for Sacrament. Uh, and, and Barker changed his mind before he went to press. And he said, uh, I'd rather do, you know, a photo uh, and he had something in mind, and I said, "Send it to us. You know, we'll, yeah. you know, we'll we'll take the other one and and you know toss it and uh, use whatever you want." Uh, and you know, when you're dealing with you know Clive Barker, who is who you know I know is an accomplished you know artist um, uh, and and photographer, you know, um, why not you know uh, use their their material? Right. Very cool. Well, I really, um, really, really appreciate your time, Barry. I, I, again, I can't thank you enough. It's been such a pleasure. I've been looking forward to this um, so much. When I first started this whole uh, podcast journey, um, you were the first people I thought that I want to chat with. I want to, you know, kind of iron out some of the smooth out some of the edges and things like that. And I know mm -hmm. that you're you're not exactly a um, you don't zoom every day, so. <laughs> So I appreciate you kind of uh, dusting off the camera and, and uh, bearing with me while we were kind of getting you on here on board here. And I, again, I really, really appreciate that. Oh, um, it, so it's it, been an it, absolute it, pleasure. It's been fun. You know, uh, um, 
you know, I, I, I have no problem. Uh, I enjoy talking about what we've done and, and hopefully, um, you know, the other people who are thinking about starting a small press, you know, will uh, um, listen to some of the things that we do and come up with their own innovation. Everybody has their own uh, niche that they, they um, um, can, can, can work into what they, uh, what they publish. Um, and, you know, I've heard more than one person, you know, mention, and I agree with them, uh, you know, it's, it's not really a job. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it's, you know, like a hobby. Right. Um, but I, I, I treat it both, you know, as something I enjoy, but I also treat it as job as far as the business aspect. Um, you know, I pay all my bills on time. Every person who writes to me, you know, emails me, gets a response usually within that day. Yeah. Um, and if, if I'm going away, not that I have with the pandemic, I put an away message, you know, uh, so that people, you know, know that I'll get back to them when I, you know, re return. And, um, uh, it, you know, I, I would hope that people, you know, most people, when they have a problem, they'll write to me and we address it. We take care of it. Once in a while, you get a nasty, you know, a person who's nasty about it. I still address the problem, but, you know, it's not like, and I don't mention that they were nasty. Right. Uh, but, you know, there's no reason to contact somebody on a first contact and say, look, you know, you sent me the wrong book. And I go, oh, darn, you know, uh, I sent the wrong book. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll take care of it. You know, don't worry about it. Right. Uh, and then, you know, and then the person goes, well, you're going to pay for the, for the return postage. No, we send things media mail. It's like three, four bucks. Uh, yeah. And I say, well, I can either, you know, um, send you a check for the return postage or you can have a credit. You know, most people take the credit I, and I give them a credit that's larger, like a 10 yeah. buck, you know, credit. Um, and, um, uh, you know, when people are going to make contacts, you know, they shouldn't think the worst of the people they're, they're contacting initially. They should think, you know, um, that they're going to be treated fairly. Now, if they're not treated fairly, you know, and I, I can tell you more than there's more than enough companies that I have dealt with, not, nothing to do with publishing, but I mean, the phone company and Amazon oh, yeah. and people like that, where- I Don't even get me started on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, where, where, where yeah. I, I really want to, you know, uh, haul off on them and tell them, you know, they can, what they can do with themselves. Right. Um, but, you know, the first contact, you know, should be a pleasant one. And, you know, right. uh, uh, if, if you dealt with, you know, if the person you're speaking to says, we'll take care of it, fine, then yeah. it's over. So that's know? the precedent. Yeah, that's what they're going to do. We, we, we ship our, all of our books um uh, uh, the printer puts them in in um um what's it called um uh, it's getting uh, let's see uh shrink wrap okay um yeah. and it, it, it's to protect the book um well if then i send it to the to the reader the customer still in shrink wrap to protect the book the mm -hmm. customer opens it up and finds out that the uh, inside flap of the dust jacket is, is is bent and contacts me again the person is is nice understands i did not see the the um uh the damage because the book was shrink wrapped. sorry part of my cut <laughs> right um yeah. and then I, I i i apologize and i send them another you know uh uh dust jacket or they'll write and they'll say look you know page 306 is is all crumpled crumpled you know again they understand it was in shrink wrap so i didn't didn't know that right that obviously was, happened at the warehouse or the press or right, what the, have you the printer and i say you know bring the book you know to a library or whatever or whatever use it as a reading copy i'll send yeah. another copy out you know to you whatever problems occur you can fix um and uh it's just a matter of, you know, it's nice if the person, you know, approaches you, uh, you know, in, in a polite manner, you know, yes, you screwed up. Can you fix it? You know, 
uh, and and make it whole. Exactly. I mean, we're all human. I mean, uh, mistakes. It's it's an inevitability. It's always you know it's going to happen, but it's a matter of what you do about that to correct it. That I think really sets you apart. You know, I mean, I think a lot of the companies that we still deal with, it's not so much that they screwed up. It's okay. What do they do to fix that? I'm okay with it. I know that if they screw up again, this is how they're going to deal with that. I'm good with that as opposed to the great I know and I'm thinking, well, this is a great company. I don't really trust how they're going to solve any issues if I have them. That's going to happen eventually. So it's, yeah, I think that's, uh, I think that that's definitely the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I mean it's like, I get a customer who will say, um, w when I can't find a book, you know, can you get back to me in, in like a month or, or two to let yeah. me know if you were able to find it? And I tell them, I'm going to forget, you know, can you, <laughs> can you just email me? You know, email yeah. me and, and I'll let you know if I found the book, you know, um, I mean, even if I found the book, I'll put it aside, but I, I might have forgotten the customer's name. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and then the person says, sure, I'll contact you in, in, in a month or two months. And, uh, you know, if you found it, fine. If not, it's not the, you know, not the end of the world because yeah. I, I can't give them something if it doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I've had people beg me for, for, um, um, for, for a book I don't have. I can um, imagine. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know uh, uh, do you happen to have a, a dinged up version of I Am Legend, you know, around? And, and I'll tell them, look, any dinged up copies I've had, I've sold long ago. I mean, I published it in around 1991, 92. So, you know, after 30 years, it's not like I'm going to uh, still have, you know, a copy of that book around. Or if they want a dust jacket for one of our earlier books, we've published several hundred books um more maybe even more so i can't keep every dust jacket that i've got uh around at some point they have to uh uh you know uh, go in the trash exactly yeah you don't exactly have a book sold, of... yeah if the book right. is sold out you know um uh i can't help but if somebody spilled coffee on their you know dust jacket uh of a book that they've had for 30 years you know uh, i tell them i'm sorry but if i don't have it you know I, I can't do don't have it yeah. which is also why people should subscribe to your newsletter so they get all these advanced notices and and such of the books and you're great at that too when you've only when you're down to a few copies or what have you you'll, you'll let people know as well so they could and the newsletter also up. has uh, each each week every two weeks we have a special um that it appears first you know in in the newsletter um um unlike again i differentiate myself by how i feel as a customer I don't want to be bombarded with with newsletters four days a week. Um, I mean, there are restaurants that that do that, and there are some publishers that send out more newsletters than they really should. We send out a newsletter every two weeks, um, you know, uh, and uh, and that's it. If we have something really special, you know, something comes up that's really special. All right, we'll have a one a one item you know newsletter, but that. We do that, um, and we, we we let people know um, at the end of the year um, if uh, I want to offer something special or, or an opportunity um, to uh, customers. We'll send out a one-item newsletter, but other than that, you know, two weeks, uh, and I've got to come up, you know, with uh, twenty-six publishers' messages every year. And it's not easy. I mean, there's only so many yeah. stories about Bradbury <laughs> and Matheson and Dallas um, that I've got. And, and with a couple of authors, not that I've, well, I've worked, well, I'm, I'm not going to mention any names, but I've worked with one author tangentially. And I, I've got like three or four negative stories, but I'm not going to commit them to, uh, uh, right. to, to, to paper. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to do anybody any uh, any good, um, yeah. and uh, uh, I mean there was one thing uh, um, that was funny about uh, about one of my authors, and uh, I asked um, uh, his son, uh, "Should I leave this alone or should I mention it?" And he said, "Leave that one alone." And you know we uh, uh, and that's you know uh, what I'll what I'll do. Uh, I'm not going to invade anybody's, you know, privacy and, uh, you know, anything that 
Matheson or Bradbury told me um, uh, that that we did uh, that we used, uh, I, you know, they were either aware of it ahead of time, or I know that you know they wouldn't, you know, um, uh, you know, be upset. Uh, uh, you know, there was one of the newsletters um, I talked about my son going over to Ray Bradbury's house and yeah. uh, signing tip sheets, uh, and I had a customer write to me and say, you know, uh, uh, I wish you had asked me to to go over to Ray's house. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. I was thinking the same thing. Um, but like, I'll help you move that fridge at Matheson's house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it was it was it was just a sweet story. Um, yeah. you know, the, the way you know uh both my son and Ray, you know, um uh, handled it. And uh um you know uh but there's only so many stories, you know, before I start having to uh you know repeat myself or try to say something in, in a little different way. Right. Yeah, I know. No, 100%. So I guess if they want the stories, they can just buy more of the stories. <laughs> yeah. And read them that way. So. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Barry. I think we'll we'll wrap things up if you're okay, if uh, you're okay with that or. No, that's, that's fine. Uh, is there anything about my writing that you want to ask? I'm um, sure. Yeah, was, I did want to ask you actually one thing about that, because I know you've um, got some incredible uh, your your blind series your eye series rather um that i've read most of them as well as some incredible standalone stories as well and i think the last time we left that i think you did mention that you were working on you did have a work in progress that i i think that was in the middle of the pandemic i think you mentioned that to me do i have that correctly or, or um, does that change as far as what you you were working on well i, I i've I finally uh, wrote. Um, I, I I wanted to do, as you know, you know, other people would not. Um, my, the main characters in, in my in most of my books are female, um, and 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 the villain often is a female, as well. Even though I, I don't use, I wouldn't use the word villain. I'd say antagonist. Right. Um, so I I wanted to write a female version of Lord of the Flies. Not the same plot, but the same concept of um, of a bunch of girls stranded on on an island, um, okay. and uh, I, th I, that was in the planning stages for like ten years. I would write, um, I would do some reading, I'd write some notes. Uh, I even had portions of dialogue that I I'd, I'd write, um, and I would, you know, take out this folder. And I'd start going through it, and I would say, "It's too much. I, I I don't know yet, you know exactly where I'm going. I I've got a lot of characters I'm going to be using, uh, so I put it aside and work on something else. Uh, and then it was I think it was before it was before the pandemic. Yeah. I finally said, "Okay, it's either now or never," um, because. I don't, there wasn't one, any one thing that triggered it. Um, but I, um, uh, I, I decided to write, write the book. And, and basically, um, uh, you know, the way I differentiated from Lord of the Flies is uh, I think, you know, first of all, in, in Lord of the Flies, um, the, the, uh, um, it, it, all the boys are around the same age. Um, and they really haven't, they're not really adolescents yet. If you, the, the girls in the story are between 16 and like 22. Um, so it, it, that changes a lot of what is gonna happen. The other thing is that Lord of the Flies, all the kids are from a single school and right. they're all white. Well, um, I've written, a I've used a lot of diverse characters. So the girls in, in, in my book, um, there's, there are black girls, there are white girls, there's Hispanic, there's an Asian girl, there's okay. a, a girl from Israel um, who has moved to this country. Um, there's an American uh, Indian. Um, uh, so, I, and within the, the, within that, you can get a lot of conflict. Hundred percent. You know, 
there's the obvious conflicts that could result, you know, that would be racial. But there are other, but I've got these girls, they're in more than one group. I got a Spanish, I got three, three, uh, three girls who are devout Christians. And they can't accept um, that the world has been destroyed, except for them, by a okay. female entity, um, Mother Earth. Um, and um, but even though those three girls, th th those the, the three girls are devout Christians, uh, two are white and one is Hispanic. So you, you don't have every, you know racial groups or nationalities all hanging around together. Um, there are a lot of different groups and there are conflicts because people will be people. Um, and, um, you know, with, with these adolescent girls, there's a lot of different, you know, uh, a, a power struggle, a power struggle here, a power struggle there. Um, all these other, you know, things that are going on. So and especially for the age range. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I, I uh, it's it's the only thing that's similar to Lord of the Flies is that they're stranded on an island, you know. Yeah. And then and the, the only, and, and another difference is that they know they're not going to get off the island. The, the rest of the, as far as they know, the rest of the world has been destroyed. Wow. Mother Earth wants to start fresh, and if these girls can prove themselves. They will be the, you know, um, they, they will start a new society. So it's not like okay. uh, uh, Lord of the Flies, it. where at the end, you know, uh, uh, something horrible happens, and then just right after that, they get rescued. Yeah, like the um, military or somebody comes in and rescues yeah, them or yes, some such a boat, thing. A warship or whatever shows yeah. up. Uh, uh, so they know they're going to be on the island for who knows how long, and. Once Hello, I started, um, I got into a groove, and uh, uh, I think I, it, you know, it turned out really. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed the way it turned out. And what stage is it in now? That is it completed, or is it in the editing stage, or ready to go um, into the world? I've uh, um, my oldest child okay. is not yet, little buddy. Hold on. Is reading it and and is going to do some editing. And, oh, okay. And once it's edited. I'm not sure exactly what is going to happen, uh, you know, after that. I think uh, um, because of the concept, it's something that a, a mass market publisher um, might be interested in. Right, but yeah. On the, well, hand, uh, and on the other hand, there is, you know, uh, some sexuality in it that a mass market publisher might not like, but that is, is you know, essential uh, to, to the book. So, yeah. Um, uh, at some point, you know, it'll see publication somewhere. Perfect. Awesome. No, I'm looking, I look forward to that because I know that's, that, that's always been your strong point through every one of your, your books is not even just the, the empowerment of, of, of women in there, which plays pivotal roles in pretty much all your books, but also the relationships of, of the various characters that you have in your book, the way they interact with each other based on their their own belief systems, the their cultural background, their their own personal agendas, and it's um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. I think that's pretty pretty incredible, especially if there's no real hope because at least in all your books there's some sort of outside hope that they can kind of cling on to. Where it sounds like in this one, it's all they really have is they're absolutely forced to. There, there's no running away from the conflict. It's right there. They are the conflict, and the yeah. island is. Sounds like it's not really going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, like the island is your testing ground, it sounds like. It's very much like my other books where at some points it starts writing itself and changing. Um, <laughs> the person who, would, who, who is one of the villains in, in, in the piece, um, she's pretty villainous. Uh, uh, she ends up not being the, the worst of the worst. Um, there's somebody else. Uh, and that that wasn't uh, um, going to occur until um, I got over halfway through uh, the book. And then when I made that decision, a lot of other things, uh, you know, began to flow, you know, naturally. Um, and uh, because at some point I was going, how am I going to end this thing? 
I don't know. I don't yet have an ending for it. Uh, I've, I mean, I, I've you know the books I've written. I remember one book, uh, and I forget which one it was. It might have been uh, either it was either Judas Eyes or uh, or Born Bad. One of them. Uh, I had an ending, and then I uh, I I wasn't done. I just felt that uh, I still had wanted to play with the characters, so I um, I wrote another ending for it. Uh, and then when I read that ending, I said, you know, I like this ending better than the uh, original ending. So that became the original ending. And the other one became an alternate ending that I just have in a file. I need to get out of here. I'm trying. Very uh, cool. So it's, it's, uh, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's just, you know, uh, a, a lot of fun, you know, um, when, when I can, when something occurs that makes me change uh, the direction I'm uh, I'm going in and uh, you know sometimes well it it, it, it always works out but with, with this once this this one plot line um, uh, came about uh, and this one character um, be, ends up becoming the the, uh, the the most vile of the vile uh, then I knew where I was heading. And it, it was like, you know, you're driving uh, somewhere uh, and, uh, you know, you keep on going from fork after fork after fork. And then you uh, uh, you either are going to go over a cliff or you're going to get to the place you want to get to. And uh, so uh, uh, I'm really pleased, you know, with uh, the way that turned out with with the, uh, the different characters I was able to uh, to explore, you know, and and all the diversity. Uh, hold on one second. Sure. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> they can go. They, they can. They can uh, I'll just. It'll. It'll go off in a minute. No problem. Yeah, I have no idea who it is. So there's no reason. So anyway, you know, um, I, I spent a good deal of time. Uh, during the pandemic, you know, uh, rereading that. Uh, I'm told that uh, Cemetery Dance has a novella that uh, I've signed tip sheets for, um, and they have the artwork from Harry Morris. Um, it, it's uh, a novella, and it's basically my 9-11 book. Um, okay. You know, it, it, uh, to a certain extent, it revolves it around 9-11, but it, it's... Uh, uh, 9 11 is like a character in the book. It's not, you know, it doesn't flashbacks occur on 9 11, but not the, uh, um, and 9 11 drives, you know, the main character. So hopefully I'll be sending you a copy of that to review. Please, please do. Um, you know, I have no idea yet when they're going to publish it. Okay. I got to write to Rich at some point and ask. <laughs> Perfect. Well, it sounds like we definitely have a lot to look forward to, not just from the authors you work with, but for you as the uh, as the author as well. So, really looking forward to all that, Barry. Great. So. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, my, I, I'm listening to my, and hopefully this isn't coming through too much on your end as well. I'm, I'm hearing my kids going bonkers That's in the right. background here. So, <laughs> perfectly fine. Right, my, perfect. my granddaughter is at college, but she used to. You know, make make a stink at times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Kids, kids are kids. Absolutely. We didn't have so, Zoom, but uh... <laughs> right. So I hope we can do this again sometime, Barry. So I know, um, you know, especially as you get some of the other books out there too. I'd, I'd love to, to do this again if you're up for it and sure. Talk a little bit more about that. So sounds great. Awesome. Well, uh, thank yeah, you so uh, much again. Once I put this through the editing. Uh, Rainer that be, I'll, I'll of course send it over to you so you can uh, get a chance to check it out as well, our conversation. Okay, and I, um, you know, once we're done with it, I'll send you the Bradbury book for review. And if you want to talk about it after, um, sure. uh, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, please do. Yeah, yeah, I would really like to, uh, to read that. I know it's, uh, yeah, that sounds like a really exciting thing. And, <laughs> and like you said, a piece of history, so how can I not say no? You always ask me uh, things that I, I can't, uh, offers I can't refuse, <laughs> and I appreciate it. <laughs> so, so keep asking. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Barry. Take care, have a good day. All right, you as well. Say bye-bye, Barry. Bye-bye. <laughs>
<laughs> Say bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> All right. We'll see you later, Barry. Thank All you. Right. Take care. You too, buddy. I'm going to disconnect now. Thank okay. You. You're welcome.